Alrighty, welcome to the Get Wealth Podcast. My name is Brennan Weersma. Today I'm here with Sasha Rowe, founder of Rivley, the virtual assistant company. So pretty excited to talk to you today. You've been featured on Forbes 30 Under 30 and um, have had quite the success starting your business. And um, yeah, so let's, I guess, start off with what, what is Rivley exactly and um, kind of how did you get started with that idea? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me on too. I'm so happy to be here. Um, Rivley, like you said, is a virtual assistant company and it was started, oh goodness, like five years ago. Um, my son was a miracle baby. I wasn't supposed to have or be able to have children. And he came along and was six weeks premature. And I had a job working in basically corporate finance at the time. And uh, it came back or came time for me to go back to work. And I just, I couldn't fathom paying somebody my entire salary to raise my son. Um, I just, I didn't feel like it was right. And so my husband and time and I decided that I would stay home. And after about three days of playing with infant toys, I realized that I also needed some type of intellectual challenge or adult conversation to um, also keep me going. So I dabbled in a few different ventures and found virtual assistants through another company called Zirtual actually. And uh, there's a, a long story there we can get into if you want to. But um, after I found that, I didn't want to go back. And I felt like there were other people that were in the same situation I was that needed the same opportunity. And so kind of overnight, we built a team and we had a flood of applications. And now five years later, here we are. So. Oh, that's awesome. So Zirtual was another virtual assistant company Is that kind of how you thought of it or were introduced to the idea yes i actually worked for that company um for six months under the original founders and after six months they shut down overnight um let go of about 400 employees just shut everybody out of our accounts and there's about 400 new virtual assistant companies the next day um, I decided to take a year off. I wanted to learn a lot more about the industry, kind of what went wrong, why it failed, um, why it hasn't or hadn't been an idea um, up until that point. And I actually helped a friend of mine build her company. And after a year of working on that with her, I did her website and built her hiring stuff, um, an online training platform and hired 16 people. And at the end of that year, she decided she wanted out of the business as well. And so how Rivley was born, I guess, was uh, through that entire experience after she called me and told me that she was gonna shut it down in two weeks. I told her I couldn't do that to this team again, because she was, she was with Zirtual as well. She was actually my manager. And, uh, in 30 days, we transferred everything. So I basically bought the assets of that company from her. And we kept our training platform that I built and we rebranded everything in 30 days, we moved all the clients over. We kept the majority of the team. I think we lost one person through that transition. Um, and myself and the leadership team, just we really hit the ground running and we just kind of took things as they came. We knew where we wanted to go. Uh, and things really just came together and the team pulled together it's something that we all wanted and we fought for it and, and we're still fighting for it today. Yeah, that's awesome. So it sounds like that transition, uh, you, you, you kind of had a big part in building the original uh, version of it with uh, the other, your partner. Um, so did that, did that help it just turning it into your own business? Because you had, you mentioned you already built the, the training plan or the system that you were operating with. It did. And even to this day, the most important part of the company to me is the team. Um, the clients are also a huge part of it. I mean, it is a, a multifaceted company because not only do we have to worry about keeping the team and the, the hiring up to date and like in conjunction with finding new clients, it's, it's a delicate balance. 
But for me, the joy and the passion is really based on the team side. And so once we have the team, you know, the clients just came to us. And my partner at that time, she was more in charge of the sales. And that, that part of it is the super stressful part of it. <laughs> um, so I, I understand why she wanted out. And, you know, there's you know, other factors that were involved in that decision as well. But uh, for me, it, it was building the team. And, and that's why we were referral only for so long, because I didn't want to lose what made Ridley so special. And that was the fact that we have a virtual team that's spread out all over the country. And I feel like I can speak for the entire team when I say this, um, but it feels closer. I feel closer to those people, those women, and now one guy, on this team, we finally have a guy on the team. Um, I feel closer to that team than I ever have working in an actual office. And for a lot of people, that's really hard to understand. But having that camaraderie and just the drama-free environment is incredible. Yeah, just from the feedback I've heard from Chelsea, for anybody who's watching, my sister works for Ridley. Uh, it's all good. Um, yeah, I'll just leave everything in. doesn't matter. My light will probably go out here in a sec, but uh, it's okay. No one's no one's uh, there's no producers to this show or anything so uh but yeah i was saying chelsea has a lot of good things to say and it sounds like you guys are all pretty close uh just from how she talks about you and the people she works with so um yeah i've definitely got to see firsthand that side of it you know it might be hard to imagine not being in an office and seeing people all the time uh, so when what what timeline was this when you branched onto your own versus when you started working for virtual is that what it was yeah. Um, so after I quit my job, it was about three months before I started working for Zirtual. And in that time, I started a uh, chocolate and confections company because um, it was around the holidays and made all kinds of like homemade candies with family recipes and sold those locally. Um, Texas is amazing because they have a lot where you can do that and you don't have to have you know like commercial grade um kitchen equipment or anything like that so that was really fun but i realized really quickly i didn't want to be in the kitchen the rest of my life um was was not for me <laughs> and then i also worked with an interior designer in dallas um making all of their custom like window treatments and did like the embroidery so i sew and and do embroidery sometimes on the, on the side. And so I was working for them doing, you know, random jobs and that was really fun. Uh, but again, it just, I got tired of it. I lost that passion I had when I started because it became work. Um, it, it lost the creativity side of it and it, it became more work. Um, and with virtual assistants, it, really played to my strengths. I believe it plays to a lot of the, the girls on the team to their strengths as well, because it is like working in an office because you're doing things, you're learning things, you're having new experiences. Each day is different. It's not monotonous. Um, and, and you get to help people. You get to work for the greater good. You get to make people more successful. You get to make people happier in their job. Um, bringing balance to clients' lives is really cool. And when we get affirmations back, whether it's on a personal level or the company level, when clients tell our client relations team, you know, that they're really happy and it's changed their lives and things like that, that those are really special moments, not only for me, but I know for the women on the team as well. It's nice to see. It sounds like you've uh, always had this drive that's internally as far as wanting to build and grow. Do you think that as far as an entrepreneurial mindset, that's always been a part of you or was that something you kind of learned along the way as you realized you wanted to um, take it into your own hands? Was that a learning process? That's a great question. Uh, I think it's always been a natural trait for me. Um, I have a tendency, I don't know if you want to call it rebellion, uh, but 
but I get really frustrated when I see things that aren't working efficiently or could be better a different way. And don't get me wrong, I know all of my ideas are not right and I don't enforce that. Um, but when I believe that they're like, for example, working from home, I think that that's absolutely, and now it's, it's a part of everyday life because of this pandemic, um, which I think is great. I mean, I, I don't think the pandemic is great at all, but I think the opportunity for parents and even like people like Chelsea who like to travel, even though she can't right now, having that freedom and that work-life balance is super important not only for parents but for people in general and i think one of the problems that we have here in our own country is this mentality that we have to work all the time we have to be slaves to our work and i just i don't agree with that and for me personally i refuse to live that way and we have in this lifetime you know we don't know what's before or after, and, and I'm not living for what's before or after, but living here in the now and, and providing for my son and trying to set an example for him, I believe we have to make the best of it. And I'm not, I'm not going to sit and, and be a slave to my work. I want to enjoy it. And then I want to shut my computer at a reasonable time every night and spend time with him. And I think everybody deserves that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's a perspective that more and more people because of this year are starting to become accustomed to when mm -hmm. they can't leave their home. Uh, I imagine a lot of people have looked to an on, some sort of online way of working, whether it's through their employer that they were already working for or just having to kind of reset because of, you know, losing your job and that kind of thing. Um, ha have you noticed that having an impact on Rivley? Because it seems like Rivley would have been one of the fewer companies like Rivley have, have you noticed any other companies kind of trying to mimic that and have you had to adapt in any way? Yes and yes. Um, there have been a few more virtual assistant companies pop up since the pandemic and I applaud them. Um, I'm not one to get jealous about competition. Uh, I want everybody su to succeed and there's, there's plenty of opportunity for that. And one thing that we had to adapt and kind of navigate through during this year is deciding whether or not to really push sales when everybody was hurting and it was really chaotic. And for me, that didn't feel right. Um, so we kept pushing through the way that we normally did. We tried some, some different like sales tactics and I, hate, I really hate using the word sales. Uh, we prefer more of a warm approach. And referrals work really well for us. Um, and we've tried some different ways to get kind of the word out about Ripley because other companies are not saying it's right or wrong. They just, I feel like there was a lot of almost like I like to call it shark marketing, um, where they're just kind of attacking anything that they can and bombarding people. Um, I had to completely get off social media. It was too overwhelming for me for a long time during the pandemic. And uh, I know our team felt a lot of the stress too. And that's one thing we talked a little bit about being in a virtual office and how great it is and how close our team is. And while that's absolutely true, working virtually does come with its, uh, not setbacks, but its difficulties, I guess, and people being stuck at home, um, kids being at home. There's a lot of people on our team that are parents. And so that routine changed for us as well. Even though we have been working virtually for nearly five years, you know, having kids at home full time or having a spouse home full time, that took a lot of attention away from being able to focus and before we had to stay at home i would go out and work in different coffee shops or different places i had a co-working space in dallas for a little while and getting out and having a change of scenery really helped clear my mind 
And so not having that, and a lot of people on the team did too, and not having that uh, definitely changed the scope of how we worked. And then our clients have clients too. And so if they had a dip in business or their clients couldn't afford it because of everything that was going on, then we lost that business too. And so it was, it was a difficult patch um, to get through. And, and uh, I'm not going to say that it wasn't, but I'm really proud of the way we handled it. Even if we did see a loss in overall revenue for the year, um, we're gaining it back now, which is fantastic. But I don't think I would go back and change anything. Yeah, that's awesome. Because all those different um, setbacks and whatever you want to call them kind of shape what is now or what it's going to be. So as, um, as long as you keep going, that's what counts. Um, it, it, as far as the, the job itself, in the beginning phases, were, were you doing virtual assistant work or have you always kind of been the, um, you know, the, the existential thinker, just kind of maneuvering the business or um, do you still do virtual assistant work and what does that look like? Uh, both actually. <laughs> um, for the first two years, I had a full-time client. In fact, everybody on our leadership team had clients. And I thought it was important for all of us to be in the, be in the industry, right? Be working in it, to be able to keep up with it, to be able to relate to people on our team and that type of thing. There was a period of time where I stepped away from having clients because I felt like the business needed more of my attention. And that was the past two years. Um, and I really enjoyed that time. I really enjoyed the, the creative part of it. I enjoyed the business part of it, the networking and, and all of that. Uh, my client that I worked with is based in California and he taught me so much. He's um, the founder of the Founder Institute and it's a, it's a global organization. And they're all about, it's a startup accelerator. And so I learned a lot from him. Um, he acted kind of as a mentor for the past two years. We kept in touch. And most recently, he and I started working together again on a part-time basis. And it's been fantastic um, just having that intellectual challenge I talked to you about in, in the very, or I mentioned in the, in the very beginning that to me is super important and not having the networking portion of it this year that I had for the past two years. Um, I didn't realize how important that was like talking to other entrepreneurs and, and having that like creative brainstorm um, conversation that's, that's important to me as an entrepreneur. And so working with clients and on the business at the same time, I feel is more fulfilling for me in this season, um, just because it does fuel the business, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, as far as transitioning into uh, running Rivley full time, was there ever a period where you weren't um, relying on either of them financially? How, how does that transition go? Because I know a lot of people, when they think about starting a business, it takes a lot of overhead and uh, it, you know you can't necessarily rely on supporting yourself through that for a certain amount of time how long did it take you to get onto your feet or was it just a seamless transition because of you already having the previous company that basically just went right into yours yeah um that's a great question let me turn on Um, as far as being financially okay on my own, I was very lucky. Um, my co-parent, and at the time he was my husband, when I started was extremely supportive. Um, and so not having clients and then having him kind of supporting the bills at home allowed me to fully focus on Ridley without drawing a salary. 
Um, it wasn't long after that because Ripley's overhead is really low, especially for a business. I mean, there's no brick and mortar. There's no, you know, building that we have to worry about anything like that. And that was great not to have to think about a ton of like financial burden as far as that goes. It wasn't long after we started, I think it was only like six weeks after we started that I was able to, I mean, I didn't pull like a normal CEO salary, like don't get me wrong. Um, but I was able to not only pay our leadership team, but also pay myself a small stipend monthly to compensate for the work that we were doing. Um, and that supported me even through moving. Um, I did move cross country to Chicago and back within a year during ha like having Ridley and that was paid for by the company. Um, really as far as like financially, like I've never paid myself a true CEO salary. Like we're still in that startup mode. Um, as far as leadership goes, like they've always had clients and that was really to not only keep them in the know, but also supplement any income that they might need. And then same with me. I mean, the business this year has dipped in revenue. And so not working with my client part-time fuels me intellectually more than anything, but it's also taking care of my bills, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so. awesome. That's actually a question I was going to ask as far as what you take and how much you reinvest back in the business. Because I, I feel like a lot of people uh, want to skip a few steps in the beginning where they get to the spot where they are aiming for you know, however many years down the road it's going to be. So just the, uh, the fact that you're, you know, putting the team first and supporting the business and uh, reinvesting, I think says a lot. So um, yeah, that's, that's definitely pretty cool. If, if you could give some advice to someone looking to start a business, uh, whether it's online or just, you know, um, a mom and pop shop in their hometown, what insight could you give to someone that has no idea where to begin and uh, what it takes. Make sure you're passionate about what you're doing. Um, Cause even the best get rich quick schemes that are out there take a lot of patience, a lot of hard work and a lot of passion. And if you're not passionate about it, when you're faced with the question to reinvest money back into the company, and even when it's the right thing to do and you shouldn't even be questioning it, um, it, it will pose a pretty big burden on you. Uh, especially if you want to keep it going or you don't. I mean, like I said, we've been in this for five years and I mean, it, it still feels like a startup and I'm okay with that. Uh, there's been nights where I have stayed up all night crying because I don't know what to do. And there are nights where I've stayed up all night because I can't sleep because I'm so excited about, you know, what's going on with the company and those highs and lows of entrepreneurship are absolutely real. And it's not something that anybody can prepare you for. Uh, it's just something that you have to be able to take as they come and you have to be able to see the light in any situation and you have to be able to pick yourself up, you know, and, and have a team that's there that if you are low and you can't pick yourself up, that you can call them and you can be reminded like why you started. And so if you, if anybody's wanting to start a business, I say, go for it. Just make sure you're passionate about it before you do, because it is the most rewarding and the most stressful job. Yeah. Sometimes those go hand in hand or, probably more times than not, right? Um, <laughs> would you say that everyone has that uh, sort of passion or drive inside of them to uh, be successful as a business owner? Or are there certain people that are just not meant to get into their own business or um, maybe do something more as like a part of a business? I would never feel comfortable putting that limitation on somebody. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has a gift. I think everybody has something that really drives them. Um, and I, I think that everybody has experience that can lead them to do anything. Uh, it just depends on what that experience is and what they're passionate about 
to be able to kind of like pull it out of them. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask people when they come to me with that, they're like, they're like I want to do something else, but I'm really not sure what I want to do. Mentoring is one of my favorite things. And this is the first question I ask them. I say, what are you passionate about? If you didn't have to stay within the confines of like social structure, right? We're all conditioned when we go to school, when we're in high school, in college, when we have our first job, even if they're like jobs at a fast food restaurant, when you're in high school, we're all conditioned to follow authority and to be trained on what to do and how to do that job well. And then if you do that job well, then you can be promoted and that's how you move up in the world. For me, breaking that mentality or that perspective is when like that passion is allowed to come out and that creativity is allowed to come out. When you can get somebody to think outside of the box, outside of themselves, outside of everything that they've learned and really decide what drives them on a personal level, it's incredible what happens. And some of them will answer immediately, but I always preface that question with, I don't want you to answer immediately. I want you to take a week at least to think about it. And we'll get back on the phone and we'll talk about it. And then we kind of like go through this process and they'll come back to me every time after that week is over. And I feel like I really didn't know where I was going to start. And then I thought about it all the time. I thought about it before I went to bed. I thought about it when I woke up and was eating my breakfast. I thought about it when I was working out. And they come back to me with this spark. And like, I'm getting chills talking about it because it's just, it's, in, it's incredible what happens. And I would even challenge you to the same thing. Think about it for a week and decide what's important to you, not what's important to society and what is on your social media feed telling you what you think is important or what, you know, you should think is important. And it's just, it's, it's amazing what happens. Yeah. That's some really good insight. I think that's an important step that people don't even get to is just setting aside some time and thinking about it. Most, you know, like you were talking about, you're getting your structure, your nine to five or your school week or whatever it is. And that's just the routine and your brain can operate well in a routine. And if you never disrupt that in any way, whether it's just with a simple question of like, what are you passionate about? It's going to be hard to really figure it out. Um, so just that step right there. I really like that. Um, so anybody watching this, take a week, go think about it. Cool. Um, as far as the uh, business world, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like it's a fairly male dominated space or um, masculine rather being a woman starting a business and kind of finding your place in that world. What are some of the challenges or if any you've experienced and kind of how have you navigated through that? Did Chelsea put this one on the list? <laughs> she, she, she mentioned it that it might be a good one, but I'm also curious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. So yes, it is a male dominated world. Uh, and there are some places that are more tolerant to women entrepreneurs, uh, like the, the big hubs, I feel like San Francisco. And I, I'm, I can't speak to women working as entrepreneurs in those places. I know some of them and they have their challenges as well. But for me personally, uh, it has been a blessing and a curse. So it's, a blessing because there is so much talk about women entrepreneurs and it's becoming more of a highlighted uh, area of conversation and I think that's really important. The curse part of it is there's still a big problem for women entrepreneurs. Um, they're not getting funded. I think two percent of women or company startups uh, are women owned that are funded by VCs and angels and things like that. Um, fundraising as a woman, for me, that was a horrific experience. Um, and even talking to other women entrepreneurs that have gone through the same thing and talking to investors and companies are being called cute. Um, they're not being taken seriously. I've had a few instances where I've had multiple meetings with 
male investors and it gets turned into a, uh, how do I word this, in a PC manner. Uh, a very uncomfortable situation for me um, and ones that I have had to kind of navigate my way in order to like leave and feel safe. Um, and that, that for me put me in, into a pretty deep depression for about eight months. Uh, I was, it was incredibly disgusting um, to say the least. And, and I feel that a lot of women entrepreneurs have experienced the same thing. It's just a really tough topic of conversation. Uh, women, personally, we like to blame ourselves. Um, we like to ask what we did wrong. And for any women that are listening to this, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, it's not, it's not your fault. Uh, you just, we need to fix it. And yeah. Do you think it's swinging in the right direction or in the wrong? I think it's swinging in the right direction. I think talking about it is, is the first step for sure. Bringing a lot of light onto situations like this. Um, I know there are companies out there that are trying to make a difference as far as like funding more female owned businesses. Uh, I know the government has some programs that they're working on. They're still flawed, but they are working on it. So I think, I think we're going in the right direction. I don't think it's fast enough. Um, I know there are men out there too that have been helping the cause as well. And that really are advocating. And I think that's important too. Um, I think women need to, to stick together, but in order for us to truly change, it's gonna take everybody. And it's gonna take basically an, an eradication of perspective that that is okay. Like those situations are okay and then people can get away with them. Yeah, I think one of the most effective ways is leading by example, which you're kind of a trailblazer as far as being in that space. So, I mean, even the people watching this, that makes an effect. So, um, yeah, I think you're doing a good job as far as from what I can tell from the outside looking in. Um, yeah, no problem. But as far as you, you were talking earlier about how the stress of the business, whether it's just the, um, you know, the adversity you faced, can cause depression or just anxiety all around, especially in 2020 people get in their head a lot with, they don't have enough to do. What, what do you do as an entrepreneur to kind of keep your headspace, um, you know, in order and deal with the stress, stresses and pressures that come with running a business? This is definitely a, a learned thing. Um, and it changes seasonally right now. It's, a shower every day after I close my computer just to kind of like wash off the day and the stress and change my mindset. Whatever happens in those 10 to 15 minutes allows me to kind of shut off my work brain and turn on my mom or girlfriend brain, right? And be present in the moment. And I think that's super important. I, I know it's super imp important for me. And that can be going for a walk for some people, just like leaving the house for a few minutes and coming back. It can be like shutting an office door. I'm in an apartment. So having my office and my living space in one, in one like small confined area, I have to do something to be able to kind of like switch, turn that switch off. Um, working out, whether that's yoga, uh, going for a walk or a hike or going, I picked up tennis um, this summer, uh, just getting outdoors, doing something active and having like that endorphin release uh, has been super important for me. I'm on a vitamin regimen, I'm eating healthy, really doing anything that I can to keep like that physical wellness absolutely plays to my mental wellness as well. And especially staying at home. Uh, last year, I was traveling at least once a month. Most of the time, it was twice a month. And not having that travel or like that ability to get out of the house or in a different space or even talk to other people, um, that was a pretty difficult transition for me as well. Uh, I used to stay up 
usually I wouldn't I had full all nighters at least three nights a week last year. And it wasn't because I was trying to, or I was like a workaholic. I mean, I was a workaholic, but my brain was just so active all the time. I didn't get tired. And then when I did, I would like sleep all weekend. So I'd stay up all week and work and feel really productive. And I was just on this high. And then I would catch up on rest. And that just, it, it didn't work whenever we had to stay home all the time, especially with my little one at home most of the week at least with me he was here uh that schedule didn't work anymore and so having that like to get back on a normal sleep schedule that was difficult as well but once i found meditation and started actually practicing meditation uh regularly that helped a lot too so i would say working physically to keep yourself well and focusing on that wellness just to create a good wellness atmosphere for your, for your mental health too is important. Yeah, that's huge. I know for me, the, the gym is kind of uh, my biggest, you know, therapy, if you want to call it that, or just gets your mind in the right place. If I go too long without getting some sort of exercise, I think that's when the like negative thoughts start creeping in and even just like doubting. Uh, I think it plays a big part with your mental state as far as just being able to you know, exercise and push yourself and then diet as well. That's, um, right. your, your gut is basically part of your brain as more research comes out. It's directly related to how you feel and, um, really even how, how you think, or, or are you on a, like a specific diet? Are you like a plant-based or, you know, just a whole, whole food? Do you have a specific what diet? <laughs> I really have to credit my boyfriend on this because he's a health nut and he does all the cooking. Um, but everything is, is super healthy. We, uh, it's not completely plant-based. There's red meat, um, but there's a lot of salads and a lot of vegetables, a lot of steaks. Um, we cook all the time and the vitamin part was really important for me. So like vitamin B, all the, the B complex, uh, vitamin C, elderberry, uh, and then the turmeric and mushroom elixirs, they're like this creamer stuff that we get from Laird Sports. I don't know if you use his or have ever ordered from that, but it's amazing. Um, so I use that in my coffee every morning instead of like creamer. So we've cut out a ton of sugar, or I have anyways, um, and replaced like empty calorie snacks with, you know, nuts and, and almonds and cashews and that type of thing. And so it's not any specific diet regimen, but we listen to a lot of podcasts and, and try out different, you know, healthy foods. And, uh, we do eat some paleo stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's made me feel like a completely different person and the working out thing. I totally agree with you. My son calls the gym church now. Mm -hmm. So every time I he's like, mom, are we going to church? <laughs> like, uh, you mean the gym? And he's like, yeah, that. Awesome. So it's, it's been, it's been fun. Cool. Um, how do you allocate your time running a business since it's not necessarily a work, normal work schedule? Do you have a morning routine uh, or is it just kind of as the day comes, you figure it out? <laughs> uh, both. So running a business, there's not a normal day, I guess you can say. Like I have reoccurring meetings on my, my calendar every week. And so those are a constant. Like I know I can can count on those. And there's certain things that I know I have to do every week. And then besides that, I'm mean, gonna try to get on my computer. I work Pacific time even though I'm in central time. And so as long as I'm on by 9 30 to 7 30 Pacific time it gives me a chance to kind of clean out my inbox and get ready for the day. And then by 10 a.m. Central time, which is 8 a.m. Pacific time, I'm working. Um, being that I'm on Pacific time, it pushes my day later. And so I'm usually, like I usually don't shut my computer until 6.30, seven at the latest, but that's really pushing it. If I'm working past seven, I get really cranky because then I know like I've pushed myself past where my balance line is, right? And um, so I really try to make it a point to shut my computer and shut off my brain as far as work stuff by 6.30 in the afternoon. 
and I've even told my boyfriend and my cat and my son both know too like if it's past 6 30 they come and bug me they're like okay it's time like it's time to stop and so that helps too uh, I used to not be good at that at all I used to just work until I got the work done and it wasn't healthy for anybody. Yeah, that's good. I'm always curious because I'm, I have no experience with running a business. Hopefully one day I don't know what it would be yet, but that's kind of part of the reason why I'm doing the podcast is so I can talk to as many people like you, whether it's just in finance or uh, starting a business, doing cool things as for work. Um, all those perspectives are interesting to hear. So I will say when you're starting, you have to give yourself grace. I mean, having those boundaries for yourself are super important. Um, but something I like to, to say is your timing is perfect. Even if you think it's not, your timing is perfect. Because maybe if you were working late on a project, it was because you were supposed to. You shouldn't beat yourself up or if it felt good or your creativity is flowing, right? You shouldn't beat yourself up for anything that you feel like if you're not doing something like somebody else, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, for like sure. You can't model your own behavior based on what somebody else is doing. And deleting that word should was a really good lesson for me. Because during the pandemic, I was like, I should be doing more. I should be doing this. I feel bad because I'm not doing this and other people are. And that just created like this negative downward spiral that I found myself not able to get out of until somebody came and they were like, it's actually somebody on our team. Like, you just need to stop, like, delete the word should and forgive yourself every time you put that on yourself and like make yourself feel bad. Because doing that, it just, like I said, it creates a negative spiral and it just, it pushes you farther and farther, like deeper into that hole. And so if you're working late one night, one night, like try not to make it a habit, but that's okay. Like let that creativity flow. And then the next day, allow yourself that two or three hours to sleep in or do something, you know, just to even out that balance. Yeah, I I hundred percent agree. It's it seems like that perspective uh, might relate more to someone like yourself that has like an overflow of motivation and drive because you kind of got to bring yourself back. Do you think there's um, a mix with people who are just inherently lazy that maybe should use the word should or <laughs> is that just a you know everyone shouldn't be hard on themselves type of thing? <laughs> uh, I think when you're being hard on yourself, it's not necessarily laziness, but a lack of momentum. Mm. And so it takes more energy to take that first baby step and kind of create that motion uh, to build that momentum. And so I don't think using the word should is even a positive thing in that because it still has a negative connotation mm -hmm. towards what what they're doing and it makes them feel bad for not doing more than they are right yeah so it's it's the language we use even in our thoughts is so powerful because it it it, it drives a perspective on on what you're thinking it drives perspective on what you do it creates filters for how you see things and if you're thoughts are negative, then the language you use with other people are going to be negative. Your overall energy for what you're doing is going to be negative and what you're putting out into the world is going to be negative. If you can change that with your internal thoughts and create positive thoughts, then you can create the upward spiral of positivity and build momentum for moving forward. That's a good way of putting it. And yeah, so more it starts from when you actually have that thing that is, you know, driving you to reach whatever it is. And then at that point is when the should has the negative connotation, because if you're already on the, the right track, you're not figuring it out. You know, you're not um, in the first step where you don't know what to do type of thing. Cool. Um, if you can't like even think about what you're supposed to be doing, um, even getting up and brushing your teeth in the, in the morning is a baby step. 
Mm-hmm. Small wins. And it leads to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And that's why the military has everybody make their bed first thing in the morning because just doing that one small task, a task builds momentum for the rest of the day. Yeah, very true. Uh, as far as the uh, your, your business, it's a lot of, uh, you mentioned referral and uh, marketing as far as just getting the business out there and recruiting clients. I think that can translate a lot into other businesses. Like maybe it's real estate, finding clients, or you sell something or uh, just marketing yourself. How, how has Rivley done that? Whether it's on social media or, um, you know, I think Chelsea was mentioning a podcast. Is, is there any things that extra things you do or that you could give advice to somebody to help their business is for, on that aspect? Absolutely. I would say start with a brand. So once you have your brand and what that brand stands for, base your marketing on that. And then also look at your target market and think of it in a psychological manner, right? So if you like the gym or sports equipment or nutritional supplements, right? When you're looking at ads on your social media for gyms, for supplements, for anything, let's let's say you're opening a gym, right? And you're looking at ads for like Planet Fitness or LA or uh, 24 Hour, I think they're closing. But if you're looking at ads for any of these companies and you pick out what you like about them you're just scrolling and you like something catches your eye even if it's for like a thero gun like those massaging gun things right and something catches your eye pay attention to what it is in that post that catches your eye and really think about it because it may be something small it may be something subliminal it may be the font it may be the way it's placed it may be the slow motion or the way that they zoom in on something, but if that speaks to you, then it's going to speak to your audience too, right? So if you're building a brand, you have your core values, you have your mission statement. So all of your marketing, all of your messaging needs to stay true to that. And all your decisions. So if something like a pandemic happens, you're like, I don't know what I should be doing. And you're looking at all these other people and you're like, oh my gosh, and you're getting down on yourself your mission statement and your brands are your foundation. And that's what you can always fall back on. And as long as you stay true to that, you're going to build brand loyalty. And then the way you're marketing, as long as it's true to your brand and you can pick out the things that psychologically trigger people, the way ads trigger you, then you can really have like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you can really speak to your audience, I guess to put it on another way. And the way that you do your social media, when people connect with you on a visual and aesthetic level, then they're going to spend more time reading about you because they're going to, they're going to want to know more. Mm-hmm. And so if you have that, then kind of bringing clients in, it's just, it's really spreading the word and getting your message out to the people that are looking for you at that point. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. So as far as if you were talking about what you're interested in, you kind of pick things that stick out to you and then apply that to your own brand. Is that kind of a good recap or? Kind of, um, that's, a, that's one way you can do it. So my educational training and, and where my passion is, is in graphic design, right? And my major was in film and digital media. And so I learned a lot about the aesthetics of marketing, um, the aesthetics of how movies are made. Like if you have something in the left-hand side of the screen, it's going to make people feel kind of uneasy because our eyes are naturally drawn to the right side of the screen. So it's like, it's things like that that you can toy with and really use to your advantage and and not in a negative way, but in, in a positive way. So if you are competing with a hundred other brands, and you want something to catch people's eye, like you want them to stop on your post, then you can put more of your graphic or whatever you're doing, like you can put something to really catch their eye on like the left-hand side of that post, right? And then have some engaging caption. 
And so it's things like that when I say to use psychology when you're marketing things, don't just like put text on the background of, you know, like a, a blank background or a color background. Sometimes that works, but don't, I wouldn't use that for our brands across the board, right? So there are elements in our branding and what we post on social media that are specific to our target market. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Is, um, and you don't have to have an answer to this, but from what you've seen of the get wealth podcast, do you have any suggestions or advice that just from the outside appearance, I know it's just a podcast, but I do plan on growing it into eventually something bigger. It's just as far as maybe like on the graphic design part of things, do you have any, I guess, advice? <laughs> I can look at it and we can okay. have another conversation. Um, but no, I think it's, it's awesome. Um, I love, even though I was a little unprepared to be on video today, I love the fact that you do have video with your podcast. I think that's really engaging. Um, I've loved when podcasts that I listen to have that option where I can have it on in the background. Um, I think that's really neat. And, but yeah, I'll take a look at your branding. Cool. Appreciate it. And then just tell Chelsea or whatever, and I'm sure she can let me know. Um, all right. Before I move on from kind of picking off, piggybacking off what you said, going back to the brand, what, what goes into creating a brand, uh, that can last or that you're, you can get behind. What, what's that process like? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Um, for me, everything has meaning and, from the name, uh, Rivley is taken from two words, thrive and virtually. Those two words that really kind of kept repeating themselves as I was going through this journey between Zirtual and then the company I helped build and then moving to Rivley. And so thrive and virtually, that's the core, R-I-V is the core of the word thrive and then V-L-Y is like the shell of uh, virtually. And so that has meaning for us. Um, and then building the brand, we took a lot of time on the core values and, and what we wanted that to mean. And then from that to the colors, some brands have numbers in them. I feel like numbers have a lot of meaning. There's a lot of research and um, different sources that you can find like what numbers mean in, in different areas, whether you're looking at like Sanskrit or the Bible or history or whatever. I and mean, there's a lot of meanings and numbers, um, colors, how they speak to people, what they can make people feel that goes into branding. Um, I mean, all of it. And so for me, Rivley was, I wanted something that was one word. It was easy to remember. Um, <laughs> I got a lot of feedback. I mean, I asked a lot of people and for me, it's intuition. So I felt like it was right. And the people that were on the team felt like it was right. And so that's what we went with. But it's important to also ask outside members, like outside of your, your company or your brand as well, and ask them what their first thought is like what it invokes when you when they say the words say it out loud write it down see what it looks like visually um that type of thing usually shorter words or names of companies are easier to remember shorter urls think about how when you're telling somebody what your email address is if you're going to have to spell it every time um that those types of, all of all of that stuff goes into a brand and then once you decide that, it is teaching people what that brand stands for and what it is and how they can connect with it and why it's sustainable or why it, you know, connects with the people or the earth or, or whatever the case may be. Um, one of the examples I like to use is like, what is, what is Nike? Everybody knows it's shoes or an athletic brand, right? But before it was Nike, what, what does the word Nike mean? I'm not sure. <laughs> exactly. So they took a word and they made a brand out of it. And it's a huge global brand. 
and it's amazing. Everybody knows what Nike is, but in the very beginning, or if you just take the word Nike, like, what would that be? Nice knees or something running brand. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you can take anything and turn it into a brand. Um, one of the articles I wrote is published on Forbes. It's kind of, it's called uncap the ceiling on your brand. And it's all about that. And, um, I love it. Cool. Could I, could I link that article in the description? If for sure, uh, just probably look it up online and I'll put that in there. Um, definitely going to read that. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I have a few more questions. Uh, what, what is the most important characteristic to become successful, whether in your business or just your personal life? What do you think that is to progress? Oh, wow. Um, I say the ability to be present. Hmm. Um, you have to be able to plan for the future, but I feel like in order to plan for the future, you really have to be present and then now, like you have to know what's going on to be able to see the success, uh, to be able to feel it. Um, to be able to feel what's going on with your team, what's going on with the industry that you're wanting to get into and to connect with your customer base or your future customer base. Uh, I mean, there's so much, so many books, so much knowledge that I've gained over the past several years and so much experience that I know is still waiting to be gained. But if I focus too much on the past, I can't see the future. If I focus too much on the future, I can't see the now. And to be able to appreciate today and appreciate the status quo, I think gives you the ability to see other things in the future and to be able to take the lessons that you were supposed to learn from things that happened in the past. I agree. Um, that's a great answer. Um, uh, I think that can be applied in many situations as far as just being able to be present. Um, one of the ideas I'm doing with this is I'm compiling all of the answers to a few questions. So it's what it's the most important characteristic to be successful. Uh, how do you define wealth and um, uh, a book recommendation, which I was planning on asking those questions, but uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Eventually I'll have that on a website that maybe Chelsea will make for me. So <laughs> cool uh, yeah so uh, as, as far as just kind of getting to those last ones you, you mentioned you've read some books is there any specific one that you would recommend to people whether for business just self-help or along those lines oh there's so many um have you read any of dr joe Dispenza's books i have not no he's a good one uh really any of his books breaking the habit of becoming yourself is really good and uh, it's definitely one I would recommend. Um, it, he talks a lot about intuition, a lot about perspectives, a lot about being able to kind of unlearn everything that we've learned by conditioning and to be able to create a reality that you want and it's it's incredible and it's a mindset that I've been working on for probably the past year, but I mean, it's just the information that are in his books are scientifically based. They bring a lot of questions or a lot of answers to questions I had about uh, things that are unseen in this world, uh, as far as like energy fields and, and how we communicate with each other, how you can perceive things without actually knowing that you're perceiving them. So he talks about consciousness and subconscious and, and all of that kind of stuff. And it's, it's super intriguing to me. Um, and it, it's changed my life for sure. So I would recommend Ooh. that. Yeah, I'll put it on the list. How do you say his name again? Dr. Joe Dispenza. Okay. I S P E N Z A. I think. Cool. And I have it on recording so I can just go back and listen to it. So perfect. And then to kind of wrap things up, um, what's your definition of wealth? That's a great question. Uh, if you would have asked me that 
five years ago, I probably would have said more, something more along the lines of like monetary wealth. Um, but today, I think there's so much more than that. I think that uh, monetary wealth is in a way freeing, like being able to buy wine or, you know, go on vacation without having to worry about how much it costs would be fantastic and extremely nice. But for me, I have found so much wealth in being able to be here for the ones that I love and that I want to support and that want to support me. And that to me is the greatest definition of wealth, having a life that is balanced and one that I don't feel enslaved to. Yeah, that's awesome. I agree. That's a common theme that I'm finding. Uh, a lot of people define it monetarily and just as far as freedom, but that's a, a good perspective on the definition of wealth. Um, well, Sasha, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, definitely learned a lot. And I think anybody watching this will as well, and as well as being inspired to you know, keep going with it, whatever they are, or maybe even start their own business. Um, so yeah, is there, is there any way that people can find you or Rivley as far as looking into the business or maybe even that want to be a virtual assistant or, you know, that type yeah. of thing? So it's Rivley.com, R-I-V-V-L-Y.com. And there's more on me too. There's a button that says meet our founder. If you're interested in that, uh, I said earlier, I haven't been on social media much, but uh, my Instagram is XO Sasha Rowe. And then if you're interested in becoming a virtual assistant, there's a careers page on our website where you can go to Ridley.com slash careers. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah. It was my pleasure. Good luck, everybody.